All right, so the Dina Perlman situation. Please welcome Dina. Hi, Dina. It was the summer of 1992, and I was desperately seeking a teacher to teach me self-esteem and how to live in the world. I was a struggling actress, and every day I would walk to my temp job in my horrible blouse with the bow that I bought from the strawberry. <laughs> and my dreadful pleather, play leather shoes that I bought from J. Chuckles. <laughs> and I would wear my Walkman and I would listen to Marion Williamson, the self-help guru, because I believed that she was a great teacher and that she could teach me to somehow overcome this horrible self-doubt that I believed was keeping me from attaining my rightful place in show business, that this this was the problem. If only it could be lifted, then I could become a great star. And I listened to those fucking tapes every day for months and months, and there were like six of them, and I listened to The Course in Miracles, and it would take a fucking miracle to do anything about my terrible insanity, and so one day I got rid of them, and I decided that I had to find a person, that someone must enter my life to teach me how to live in the world. <laughs> One day, I walked into the New York Comedy Club to do a comedy spot. At the time, I was doing a lot of stand-up comedy, and I saw him for the first time. And the second I saw him, I'll never forget it, I thought, ew, it's not, it wasn't, it wasn't even like, ew, ew, it was just like, ah, that's not for me, I don't want that. And he, like, zeroed in on me, but not in like a sexy sort of Sultan of Dubai kind of, I want to take you to my penthouse. It was nothing like that. It was like, it was like he had like this kind of hangdog, kind of like Mickey Rourke kind of vibe, but a face like Walter Matthau, you know? So it, it was jarring, the combination. And he, he came up to me, he's like, hey, you know, what's your name? You know, you look a lot like my mother, she passed away. <laughs> And I was like, uh, okay, well, I'm over here, sort of doing something right now, so. <laughs> I, just, I just didn't want everything to do with him. And then I watched him do his stand-up comedy act, and it was atrocious. It was like, it was a lot of like jokety jokes. You know when your dentist tells you a joke, and you kind of lay up like, ah, okay, all right. Ah, I get you. Ah. It was like those kind of jokes, and there was, but when I tell you, he was absolutely killing, like he was killing with that act, and the, the annoying thing about his, the way he was killing was, he was really killing, he was on fire, and after every time he got a laugh, he'd do like a karate kick, you know what I mean? He'd get a big laugh and then he'd do like an air box. <laughs> Who is this person? Who does he think he is? Or worse, this was the worst part. He'd get a big laugh, then he'd get another laugh, then he'd get another laugh and he'd go, I fucking love you guys. I'm like, can you imagine? Like, I'm getting laughs now, but could you imagine me being like, I love you. I, do you love me? No, you don't know me. Like, what, what was that? It, it annoyed me to no end, and over time, every night, I would see him, you know, at the comedy clubs, and he, you know, he'd always ask me out in that kind of like hang dog, he'd be like, you should come to my house in New Jersey and do your laundry, and I'd be like, no, I'm not doing that. I have no interest in doing that. Why would I want to do that? Because around people who are very low key, like I don't kind of play into it, and I get very like, I'm enunciating right now, and I have elocution. <laughs> so I just wasn't, all right. So one day, I was at the Boston Comedy Club, and I had had a terrible set, but this was sort of par for the course for me, because night after night was brutal, really. Chicken bones in my hair, I and mean, every night, you suck, get off, like every night. And the temping, and the strawberry, it was just a bad time in my life. And I'm sitting back there, and I'm smoking. I remember this was in those years. And I'm smoking and I'm watching him on stage and he's killing, like killing again. And I thought to myself, this is, this is, this is my teacher. This man will be my teacher. He's, 
he, he, because, wait a second, look at this man, look at him. You see, the, he beat the system, friends, because the system says, system say, in order to be stand-up comic, you must be funny. Number one, he was not funny. Number two, he had no talent. Number three, he was not an intelligent man, friends. He was, he was not a smart man. Number four, he was wildly unattractive. And I mean, I don't mean like that kind of lovable ugly, like, oh, look at the ugly. No, I don't mean that. I mean like, oh, that's horrible. Oh. You know, get, get the children, get the children. Oh. Number five, I, at the time I was doing medical transcription in a hospital, so I used this kind of vocabulary. He had terrible body habitus. Or <laughs> <laughs> what would we say? I, I used many terms. I, this was facies or face, but his facies, his body habitus. He had very poor uh, carriage. He did not. He had very poor alignment. Uh, his midclavicular line. <laughs> Poor hygiene, he had dreadful breath. I mean, he, he had scurvy. I'm only kidding. He didn't, he didn't have scurvy, I'm just enumerating. But anyway, but as, as, I, as I'm watching him, I'm thinking to myself, this man, his inner monologue should be, I cannot leave the house because I'm not funny, I have no talent, I'm not into, but no, instead, here he is succeeding while I answer the phone at a pipe company and wear substandard clothing. How is this fair? He asked me to go out with him, I accepted it. About two years later, now we're in a relationship, and I, wait a second, wait a second! No, wait! Listen to me! Wait! I hated him! I mean, you know when like you make fun of a boyfriend with your friends? But this went on for two years, and they were like, just break up with him. I'm like, yeah, I know, but anyway. I hated, I hated him, I loathed him. So I felt that he wasn't paying enough attention to me. So I do what all girls do when you're not paying enough attention. I broke up with him so he'd come groveling back, which of course he didn't because he had a tremendous ego. When I called him on the phone, I was like, please, please take me back. And I'm in the horrible outfit and I'm begging on the phone. And he's like, no, no, no. And then he says this to me. He goes, you know, Dina, I want to ask you a question. I said, what? What is it, darling? Anything? What? He goes, you know what? I don't know what to do because, uh, you know, all these agents want to submit me for Saturday Night Live. Live, and I don't know which agent I should... I said, wait a second. I said, you? <laughs> you? <laughs> Come on! Not you! You don't... You aren't, first of all, first of all, you have to be funny for that. That's a comedy show. You're not funny at all. You don't have... Secondly, you have to have talent. What if they ask you to do an impersonation of some kind? You can't create characters. I'm the one creating characters. Why are you getting opportunities and I'm... Yes, fade in, fade out. I never called him again. I spent the rest of that summer of 94 mourning him, really mourning him, and every night I would light candles. I lit candles over this fat fuck. Every night I would light candles, and I would say to myself, no matter what happens, I have myself. I have myself. And for that, he was a great teacher. Thank you.